Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of our Liechtenstein Institute on Self-Determination here in the chapel of Princeton University. 10 years ago, December 2000, it was my pleasure to provide the means for the foundation of the LISD at Princeton for three reasons. Because Princeton, as a top university, is in close proximity to the United Nations headquarters in New York. Because President Woodrow Wilson, who was concerned with democratization, self-determination, and the state, was professor of politics and president at Princeton. And because Professor Dan Speck-Ruber, as he has mentioned, and I have worked together on issues related to self-determination and the state since the early 1980s. In the years since, I have devoted a great amount of my time to study and to write my book, The State in the Third Millennium. Already in the 1960s, I had immersed myself in the study of the state when I was a student of economics and law and was supposed to become a monarch of a mini-state. According to the prevailing wisdom at that time and now, monarchies and mini-states like the Principality of Liechtenstein should have disappeared at least a century ago. Beginning with history, I analyzed the human past on the different continents, from the cultures of the Stone Age up to the present, especially also how states emerged, how they are organized, how they tend to disappear and to be replaced by other states. Once I began to understand the factors which influence the size and the organization of states, I have begun to look into the future. It seems that three factors have influenced the size of the state in the past and, in my opinion, will continue to influence them also in the third millennium. Military technology, geography, and free trade. When military technology favors the aggressor large and centralized states dominate the political landscape on our planet. When military technology favors the defender, small states or decentralized large states prevail. Geography also is important. It has always been difficult to conquer and to control mountainous regions, for instance, Afghanistan or Switzerland. While geography cannot be changed, technology can alter the advantages and disadvantages of geography. Since the end of World War II, developments in military technology overall favored the defender, as long as he adopted the appropriate defense <coughs> strategy. Cheap firepower in the hands of low-cost infantry managed to defeat highly mechanized divisions and shoot down expensive helicopters and airplanes. Free trade has been an important factor, usually underestimated in its influence on the size of states. Free trade has always been more important for smaller states than for larger ones. As they, have to, as they are more dependent on exports to pay for their imports. Large states have much more resources available within their territory and are therefore less dependent on free trade. Since World War II, technologic, technological progress not only has favored the defender, but also dramatically reduced transportation costs of goods, services, information, and people. 
markets protected by high transportation costs in the manufacturing and service sector suddenly had to open up. Those states which tried to protect their markets by restricting free trade lost out economically and sooner or later could not afford anymore to develop or to buy the most advanced military technology. The collapse of the colonial empires and the Soviet empire with their protected markets and the high costs of maintaining the empires against a population willing to fight for independence was therefore no surprise. It seems that this will not change in the foreseeable future. Globalization, science and technology fortunately cause not only problems but offer huge opportunities to humanity to address its problems. The challenge for the third millennium will be to develop and to implement a state model which fulfills the following conditions. First, a state model which prevents wars between states as well as civil wars. Second, a state model which serves not only a privileged section of the population, but which serves the whole population inside the state. Third, a state model which offers the people a maximum of democracy and the rule of law. And fourth, a state model which is geared to the competition of the age of globalization. As a young man, I was very impressed how Switzerland had solved a minority problem in the canton of Bern. The canton of Bern is not only one of the largest and most important cantons of Switzerland, but Bern is also the capital of Switzerland. In the Jura region of the canton, the French-speaking Catholics felt politically and economically disadvantaged compared to the German-speaking Protestant majority of Bern. The French-speaking population aspired to greater autonomy for the Jura region, but they met with resistance from the German-speaking majority. The conflict escalated, there were bomb attacks, and radical elements wanted Jura to become part of France. The confederal Swiss government intervened in this internal conflict and mediated a solution in 1974. The French-speaking regions of the canton of Bern voted for Jura to become a separate canton. This decision was supported by a clear majority, although some French-speaking communities chose to remain in the canton of Bern. Over the years, the political and economic developments and the Jura region exceeded, or in the canton exceeded expectations, and several French speaking communities that had remained with Bern decided to join the canton of Jura. This peaceful and democratic solution after such violent conflict was for me an impressive example of a successful experiment of in self-determination at the local level. A state model which is to secure peace, the rule of law, democracy, and the welfare of the population has to withdraw from the state the monopoly on its territory. The emigration of the population is only a realistic alternative in our world if the affected population can emigrate with their territory. In order to realize it, the political units with the right of self-determination have to be very small. I was able to introduce the right of self-determination on a local level in the Liechtenstein Constitution through a popular vote. Each of our 11 communities in Liechtenstein has the right to renounce its membership in the principality and become an independent state or join another state if the majority of the population in the community decides so. 
the larger the political units with the right of self-determination, whether they are called provinces, federal states or cantons, the greater the danger that they will leave the state. The greater also is the danger that inside the new states there will be minorities who are discriminated against and who will one day defend themselves violently. The breakup of Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, the colonial empires, or also the Austrian-Hungarian Empire clearly shows the problems when those units are too large. The smallest political unit in most states, which are more or less well-defined politically and territorially, are the local communities like villages or cities. In the past, local communities were sometimes divided, like the city of Berlin, but it is questionable if that makes much sense. There is much to be said for treating local communities as political units which should not be divided territorially any further. A community can consist of a village with a few hundred inhabitants and a few square kilometers, or of a large city with several million inhabitants and several thousand square kilometers. In a local community, disadvantaged minorities can also emerge if the majority of the population votes to withdraw from the existing state. Usually such minorities are better integrated in their community and emigration to a neighboring community is easier. In a small community, it will always be very difficult to convince a majority of the population that the withdrawal from the existing state is the right solution. Let's take a glimpse into a distant future when the states of this world have become service companies which are in peaceful competition for their potential customers. What are the duties left to the state in the third millennium which cannot be solved better and cheaper by private enterprise or by the communities themselves? In my opinion, only foreign policy, law and order, education and state finances remain with the state. All the other duties can be fulfilled better and cheaper on the level of the communities or by private enterprise. I will not deal with foreign policy as this matter will probably also in the future be very different from state to, to state because of geography, history and other reasons. For the vast majority of the population, the most important task of the state is to give them law and order. For having law and order, most people are willing to pay a high price, either financially or by giving up some of their freedom and political rights. When anarchy looms, the call for the strong man or the dictator follows who is then supposed to rule with an iron fist. Whoever wants to have democracy and rule of law will see that the maintenance of law and order is by far the most important task of a state, long before all the other tasks which have been taken over by the state today. In order for the democratic constitutional state to function, the following institutions have to cooperate, the police, the public prosecution, the courts, and the legislator. In my remarks, I restrict myself to the legislator, as he has the main responsibility whether the democratic constitutional state will maintain law and order or not.